the general overview is that we want to get to basically contours of where the coast has been over the years, right? So, and then eventually we will be putting this on uh, an interactive uh, folio map that just kind of resides in the notebook. And here we can see we're going from the default time um, extent is from 2013 to 2019. And the most processing intensive part is actually kind of like creating the composites. And the most technical part, I would say, is actually just um, identifying the water. And here we're going to use a very simple band indice uh, called MNDWI, uh, or Modified um, Normalized Difference Water Index. And what's nice about that is it's actually pretty light, lightweight um, compared to some of the other in the sense that we really only need like the green band <laughs> uh, to, to calculate it. Um, and so this makes it really nice, especially when you want to do like larger areas. Um, I'm also going to use uh, Dask today. And I thought just kind of a refresher on how to use Dask in the environment. We're not going to dive into the um, basically the, the technical side of Dask. But I wanted to make sure that everybody kind of understood the way to use Dask in the Jupyter Lab environment and just kind of give a review of that. Um, and feel free to just interrupt me or ask questions as I'm going through this. So uh, there was, I was told that there was a request specifically for looking at um, uh, basically Dakar. And I went ahead and ran the notebook on that area, but um, because Dakar is quite a uh, urbanized area, um, it's actually quite steady. I mean, it's kind of got a, a hardened coast. We do see some errors here, some changes here, but um, it, when I went through it, I think most of these changes are kind of due to cloud cover um, and, and just some slight noise in the data uh and they seem to stay you know except for you know kind of the late the inland lakes um it's quite a constant um shoreline so i thought i'd show just how to use the notebook as is and then we'll talk about kind of how you might want to modify it to your purposes and what you can do for that so uh let's go ahead and let's see <sighs> so uh, actually, I think I'm just going to restart the kernel and then I want to clear, I, I don't need to clear all the output. So the, uh, first thing we load, um, kind of the scripts that we'll be needing, um, for here, the one that, uh, I think does a lot of the work here is the sub pixel contours that we haven't seen in a previous notebook we've gone over. Um, and it's actually what's actually taking you, you give it a value and it will actually divide, um, your, uh, it'll create the nice vector files, um, that will divide, uh, that here it will be creating the coastline. We're going to set it to zero because MNDWI, the band of the sea likes to set, um, it, basically what you're doing is you're pushing non-water pixels and water pixels on either side of zero. And so when we give it the zero value, it'll actually show us where the coast is. Uh, it can be useful for um, other things as well, but that's how we're using it today. Um, and uh, yeah, oh, we have a request is a good example. Okay, we can get to that in a second. So uh, the first thing here, so sometimes you'll see this error if you're running multiple notebooks. Um, basically, it's just saying that Dask is running somewhere else in the lab environment. And um, the reason we like to use Dask, right, is to, you know, kind of preserve our memory. It allows us to take lo these larger extents and break them up into chunks. By default, this notebook is not a large extent, but I want to show you something that might be kind of helpful. So one thing is, if you take this link right here and you copy it, and you go over to the Dask tab on the left left hand side, you can copy this link. Well, you can actually just click through this link, right? 
and it will give you this UI where you can look at the workers, the different tasks and stuff, but I don't find this nearly as convenient as having it running in the lab environment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna paste this here and press enter. And that me and if all these turn orange, this means that you are now connected to that Dask environment. And one thing that's kind of nice about that is I like to keep kind of my lab environment set up a specific way. So if you click on one of these, I really like looking at the progress tab as I'm going through. And I usually just kind of keep it over here down at the bottom. And you'll actually see, it'll actually prop up a progress bar and show kind of what's going on. And it's almost nice to have this just to know what's going on for when you're processing uh, larger amounts of data, because oftentimes you'll hit enter on a cell and that cell will then start calculating away and you're not really sure what's going on, what's taking so long. And we're, you know, we're all, we're all very impatient. And so it's always nice to have some sort of feedback of like how much longer you have to wait uh, for something to complete. This sh this should not take long. So we start the we create the data cube object, and um, here are the analysis parameters. Basically, we have a location, we have the size of our uh, of our analysis, um, the time range, the time step. Now the time step is actually kind of tricky because of the way um, like X-ray does the sampling. And uh, I'll go ahead and post this in chat. This is probably too much information, but if you ever get stuck or want a cheat sheet um, for how you create the refer to the to extensive time for this, uh, it uses the pandas uh, date offset. Um, string encoding <laughs> this is really confusing and they they're kind of opaque on actually what they mean um but they are here if you get stuck it's what i use as a reference um and so yeah uh we'll see that i'll point that out as we come to it um the uh and then another kind of interesting thing when we're talking about the coast is the coast is really not a static area and this is one of the reasons it makes it interesting right like the the coast is constantly changing um and one of the big reasons it's uh you know one of the big ways it's changing is not only erosion but also the tide right like it's very seasonal um and so when we're talking about the coast where do we exactly mean and one thing that would be helpful is that we're going to have this time series, right? That's been taken at many points in time, but the tide may be at different, it will be at different points in time when this was taken. So even though Landsat or whatever satellite, whatever polar orbiting satellite we're getting images from um, is taking the picture at the same time of day, every single time, right? The, the tide will be at a different period as it, uh, you know, as the lunar cycle continues, right? Uh, and, and and the solar cycle. So it's, when we're talking about uh, the tides, one of the initial parameters we can set is this tide range. And this is actually going to be a percentile of um, between the max, right? Being the hundred, you know, the, the absolute highest tide being like the hundredth percentile and the absolute lowest tide being the zero percentile, right? What what range of images do we want to select for where it was in this title pattern? And this will become kind of more apparent as we go through. So uh, the first thing that's always really helpful is uh, kind of seeing the analysis area with the display map. Um, I don't really want to look at Dakar again. Um, I would like to look at uh the st louis area because i know it's interesting <laughs> and i know i know i know stuff is i know the shore has actually changed um quite significantly here so one thing that's kind of nice if you want to retarget you can actually just click on this map and it displays the coordinates really nicely for you so i can just copy them and paste them into my latitude and longitude variables here and i can run the cell to lock that in. And then we can run this cell one more time to see if uh, this area looks good. And it looks nice. We have a square. Uh, we have, you know, it's centered where we wanted it to be. 
So uh, the next step is to load the data. And uh, so here, actually, let me expand my screen up a little bit and drag this a little bit down. So the uh, for loading the data, um, the it's kind of the standard. We're just using Landsat here. One thing to be aware of um, is that this default notebook, if you're targeting it towards a new area, right, uses the Landsat 8 uh, imagery. And the Landsat 8 imagery, uh, I don't know where I'm zoomed in. There we go. The Landsat 8 imagery, when you go to the Explorer Digital Earth Africa, you can see its actual uh, extents here. Um, if you need to check if like the area you want to, uh, you, because we are looking at change over much longer periods of time, the annual geomedians, which does cover, um, all of Africa might also be a good, uh, candidate to use. Um, you would have to modify it a little bit, but, uh, because you, we're going to be making comp composites here, but if you wanted to, you could use the, uh, computed, uh, uh, geomedians. So, um, yeah, where was I? Oh, loading the data. So we're going to load the data. And then, uh, this is just showing us our data set. We can see that we have 144, uh, time slices and that without getting, I guess, too much into Dask is that the, our whole data set has been sliced right? It's taking each time capture as a chunk to process is, is what this line means here um, that you may not be familiar with if you're not familiar with Dask. So we look at our, uh, we can look at our data. There's a lot of, there's a lot of clouds here, but we should see that at least has the coast in it. Right. We have plenty of good, clear uh, pictures. There is some uh, noise. I, I believe that's because those are maybe saturated pixels because of the bright sand, but um, let's, I, I don't want to get too into that. So um, here's, here's the modified, you can read this if you're interested, the modified uh, normalized difference water index. Brian, just it's, to interrupt it, one moment, yes. I think uh, the notebook may not be updating on our side. Um, it still oh, shows really? us kind of at the second cell where we're just loading the parameters. Are you okay. further down the notebook? A little bit, not, I'm showing, okay, yes. Let me stop and share, reshare my screen. Okay. Much better. So the RGB function here is just to kind of take a look at the data and make sure you're on target. Make sure everything looks good. See how much data you may or may not be, you know, it allows you to kind of browse through and see how much data you may or may not be missing due to cloud masking. Um, there's a there's a tidbit in the notebook on actually what the MNDWI is. Uh, I suggest reading it. If you're not familiar with it, it's good to know. It's a nice index. Um, but uh, the idea is that, you know, if you're if you're on this side of the bar, if you're greater than zero, it's most likely classified as water. If you're lower than zero, it's most likely uh, it's classifying it as uh, land or not water, uh, I should say. Um, and we can see the results of that here, and it seems to have done a decent job. Uh, so, so real quick, Brian, in the uh, cell above, we're just calling Data Cube to uh, look at the um, M and DWI index specifically, right? Uh, actually, right here. here. So we're looking at compute, yeah, sir. Either so Landsat underscore DS calculate yep. indices. So that's where we're actually asking it to call the that particular yes. index to look at. Okay. Yeah. So I should I should be a little bit more explicit about this. So the idea right is that we up in this top cell we load up a bunch of scripts that reside on the sandbox. Right. Um, one of them is calculate indices, which have built into it a lot of very common indices, and MDWI happens to be one of these. So in order to calculate it, that's what we're doing here. Um, for loading the data, we're using load ARD or load analysis ready data. And and it's also using the most common CRS, but um, I'm, I just kind of glossed over that in the interest of time. And then the, 
for the RGB, we're using uh, one of the functions from the uh, DE Africa plotting uh, script that's available. Um, and that's all. That's if you have any questions about that, I highly recommend uh, going to the scripts folder, and that's where all of these are um, coming from. So. I'll actually share that link here for the band indices in the chat. Okay. So everyone can look at that. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. No problem. Um, so we we have now we've loaded our data. We have a way to classify water and not water. Um, and the next uh, the next step is to actually filter all of our captures by uh, what phase of the tide we would like to look at, right? Like, would we only like to look at high tide, a selection of high tide captures, or it's sometime when the, uh, you know, it's an average tide, you know, it's like right in between the extremes, or we would like to look at it only when it's low tide. And we can, we can adjust that by adjusting the tide range here. And this is going to be a quantile um, here. And so the way it does this is it's actually using, yes. Another quick question for you, Ryan. So yeah. is the, uh, in the current um, selection here where we have 0 0.5 to one, is that kind yes. of the average um, of the tide here? Yeah, we're gonna see that um, graphically here in a second. Okay. So cool. what, what this cell is doing, right? And this is, it's actually taking a tidal model and then it's adding to our, actually let's, might be a little bit easier to look at this if I get rid of that. So the, we have our data, we've pulled out of the data cube, right? So we have 144 time slices. The images are 720 pixels by 743 pixels, right? And um, then we have each one of our bands here, right? Red, green, blue, uh, shortwave, infrared. And then we added, with the calculate MNDWI, we added the, um, uh, we actually added the MNDWI to our X-ray, right? Which is this? Uh, which is the object we're actually manipulating in this notebook? And what we've done here in this cell, when we when we tag it, when we add title tags, is basically we're adding kind of what was the height of the tide at each time slice when the satellite image was captured, um, and that is now actually a band we have here. And what we can do, um, you know, let me close this. Well, this this tide height band is what we're going to use. And what we can do is we can say if this tide height is in the top 50% or the top 20% or like the bottom, you know, 20 bottom 25% or something, whatever thresholds we want to set, we can then select the other bands which make up the satellite capture based on the values in this. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So uh, we can look at so this is this is a visual representation of what i was just trying to explain which is that we have the tide uh variability here over you know from 2013 to 2020 and we can see that we're taking the 50th percentile to the i think it was the default was 100 right and th those are the captures we're gonna take we're gonna use to represent um, the, to kind of be our coast. Um, and so we need to filter the data set here. And so basically this is saying from the Landsat data set. So the Landsat filtered X-ray is basically the Landsat data set selecting cell um, all the times at which uh, the tide, the Landsat from the Landsat data set tide height, right? is either greater than the mid, uh, median, uh, min tide and less than or equal to the uh, max tide. So anyways, <laughs> so the uh, we select our data. Um, and then now, once we've done that, we still have the problem of clouds. Clouds always plague our images, right? And so we we probably want to make uh, a composite noise, or a composite. I was noise free summary was what I was looking at. Uh, we want to make a composite that's um, you know kind of more immune to uh, you know 
cloud masking or the no, you know noise that clouds make or even in this case a lot of times beaches are very bright and they can get masked as being mistaken for clouds as well um and so that's what's happening here and you can see how this is kind of nice because as we're running this it's taking taking a second I promise we're almost done. <laughs> Let's see. Is there anything else in the chat? All right. All right. And here are the results. And this is uh, kind of a large area. I, I think I modified it earlier, actually, to be a little bit larger. I think by default, it's like 0 0.15. So it should run faster if you're looking at a smaller area. Um, and then the next... Uh, and so this is an example of the yearly kind of summary. So we've taken all of our uh, notice here. We went from, so this has kind of been a, a step of filtering more like a lot of data into smaller and smaller amounts of data, right? So we had 140 ti 144 time slices with a bunch of different indices, right? Um, we then took those, we looked, we created water and not water, and we had the tide height. And then of the 144 time slices, we then only selected 72 where the tide was high by our definition. And then uh, now we've taken all of those time slices that we wanted and we've uh, basically averaged them together along the time dimension with this, uh, with this median method, right? And uh, we, for each year, so we have 2013 through 2019. And that's what we're looking at here. So now looking at these, we would like to extract just the shoreline as a GeoJSON, basically. And we're using the um, subpixel contours that I pointed out earlier from one of the scripts to do this. And we're passing it this Z value of zero, which is where we're actually gonna draw the line, right? Um, and so this, we have to pass it a CRS and a transform. This is, I guess, a little bit more uh, complicated. The minimum number of vertices is kind of, you know, um, an idea of you can set thresholds on the complexity of the line to be drawn. Um, but if I run this, we should be able to see actually uh, in the St. Louis area that a lot of the coastlines are, you know, especially from this zoomed out thing are actually quite static. But we can actually see in these very like shallow tidal pools, right, that um, there's been, uh, you know, based on the averaging, uh, there's actually, you know, the coast actually is quite dynamic in those areas. Um, and... Good question for you, Ryan. Yes. So if we wanted to, I think you pointed this out earlier, but if you wouldn't mind just maybe just pointing out one more time. Right now, I see that we have a map basically for each year if we wanted to separate that out into you know six month periods for instance where would we do that right so it, it's right here when we're making our summaries so uh earlier up in the parameter section i i think this you know if you're not familiar with notebooks this uh, might be a little bit confusing but we set a time step of one year right and they, the, and up here in the explanation for this parameter, they the suggested values are either one year or uh, six months. And so if we wanted to, we could set this to six months um, as an example, or using this, <laughs> this these shortcuts here, which I find quite confusing, you can set your own custom thing, such as being like every three months or seasonally or something of that nature. Um, and uh, and so, those are with the parameters you pointed out in pandas, uh, correct? Yes, yes, yes. Great. Uh, I think I'm going to sneeze. Sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. No, um, yeah. <laughs> Brain. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, currently, I'm also working for the shoreline change. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? So, but my study area is uh, Unguja Islands. 
So okay. I try to compute the tides. I'm trying to compute the tides between 1985 and 2020. I mean, mm -hmm. so it uh, when I compute these tides uh, in between these years, it produces the tides for all years. But um, surprisingly, when I analyze the data on manual basis, some years produce no results. For example, when I try to, 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 to compute, maybe in 1985, so it showed that no result found. But when I try to combine in, from 1985 to 2020, it produced the tides results. So what's the, what is the matter here? Because so my concern, for... I want to look on which year Sorry. So it, it worked for, when did it work and when did it not? Sorry. Was it working for specific date ranges and not others is what you were saying? When I, when I try to compute in range, maybe from 1985 to 2020, mm -hmm. it produced all tides for all years. I mean, it produced the tides for every year. But when I try to analyze on monthly, ba on manual basis, sorry, some years produce no results. And, and when, you, when you say manually, that, that I, I just want to make sure we understand each other when you say manually. Do you mean that you're going in and adjusting um, the, uh, I guess so I, I... Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm not working on the coastal erosion use case, but I'm working on tidal modeling, but in the same perspective, because I'm working on the same uh, problem, I want to, right. to, to, to analyze the shoreline change. So I try to use the tidal modeling. So it shows that some years doesn't have result, but yeah, it could be maybe no results, or no types in those years. So I, I, I'm still confused yeah, so because when I... For, for many areas that I have run mm -hmm. the notebooks over, the tide is quite good. The tidal model is quite good. I have seen times where I get kind of errors in the data and I'm actually not so sure where errors from the tide come from so for instance when i was running it um so, so so maybe let me let me share my screen sure so you see something? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you see this one. When I'm trying to do to, to set maybe the range between maybe 1985 to 2020, yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. So okay, keep going. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, uh, so no CRS versus training. Okay. So this is a great question. So what's actually happening here is mm -hmm. it's saying this is like a CRS error. It's actually not a CRS error. It's saying that it, it got to the point where it couldn't process well, anything because it didn't sorry, have a CRS. Sorry. I did. sorry. So let, let, let me yeah. run again this one. Okay. This is not the error you're saying. So yeah, this is work <laughs> fine. Yeah, this is work fine. Okay, okay. And uh, this is what I got. Yeah, this one. It yeah, means so, it so shows the big errors. Tide, yeah, tide, tides for every year. Yeah, but when I try to to, to analyze, maybe for the twenty. 
2013 maybe 2013 from first yeah. of the january to 2013 of the december maybe mm -hmm. so when i try to run this one to look on which month and uh, for at what heights of the title in this month it show no result Oh, sorry, 2013 works well. 2012, sorry. 20, 2012, 2012. You see this one, 2012, no, no data was found. Right, While okay. In the range, it was shown. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the title model actually is more complete than the actual Landsat data. So if you, if you scroll all the way up to the top of the notebook. This one? So, yeah. So just, just scroll all the way, all the very, very top cell, all the way up. <laughs> right. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> all the way up. <laughs> There you go. Okay, so this is uh, so. Um, notice that these are using the LS5, LS7, yeah. and LS8 uh, scenes, right? So go ahead and just like click on the LS8 scene ah. uh, link there. By the way. Okay, so this brings you up to the kind of like explorer view of the data cube, and this is actually showing you where things are. So you might get an error like that <laughs> when <laughs> you are out of the um kind of like the range of uh the data that's actually available in the data cube and this is why i was actually suggesting the geo media the annual geo medians is actually being a good replacement here potentially if you're looking at longer scale changes so for instance we can see here that this data only stretches from 2013 to 2020 right and, and so when you went back to 2012 there's no data so if we actually go to, if you click on the products link up at the top of the page there. Oh, yeah, so. Yeah, right. so, yeah. so, so yeah, were you loading uh, LS7 as well at the same time? Yes. Really, okay. Because in the query, yeah, I this, was reading. the product is also... Oh, yeah, you, you have the full yeah. list. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there is something strange here going on. So, mm -hmm. go, go to the... Oh, but you have the... Oh, okay. This is what's happening. My, uh, so, if you look at the output CRS, uh, okay. change that LS8 to LS7. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Maybe because too. what it's doing is it's trying to look up for LS8, a CRS for a time range it doesn't yeah. have. And then... And then are we getting a new error now? Let's see. Yeah. No data. Available. No data available for the query. Ensure that the products have a specified time and location request. So so now we're down to the no data thing. So load errors, but it should load ARD. Uh, go back up a little bit more to this cell. Load AR, see, load ARD should be able to take the thing. I might. So for the output CRS, a I might actually ignoring SLC off observation. So okay, so th here's this other problem is for Landsat seven. Um, uh, there was something called the scan. <laughs> this, this is getting really really technical. So <laughs> the, there was a scan line. So SLC SLC stands for scan line correction off observations. Mm -hmm. So in 20, I, I actually don't want to say the date because I'm probably going to get it wrong, but um, uh, Landsat 7 actually had a like a part malfunction and where the scan line correction, anyways, it's, it's not important. It may be saying there's no data there because it's ignoring uh, the kind of corrupted uh, um, Landsat 7 data. So basically it's saying it found the CRS and everything, but because it's it's ignoring the SLC off observations, 
-hmm. it's actually there's actually no good observations potentially from landsat 7 there i would kind of have to mess around with this what i would do i would do two things i would one manually set your crs so mm -hmm. if you do like uh dc dot list products right um or something like that you can find the crs that you know uh i mean you can also just use whatever it's so if you just uh here let me share my screen Okay, so for some time during the um, Landsat 7, even though it's stretching from 1999 to 2012, sometime during this era, era here between like 2012 and 2005, we can actually, we can look it up here in a second. Um, there was actually a, an error, a problem that occurred with Landsat 7. So load ARD may be ignoring the data it collected during that period and it may be telling you there's no data available for that time period which would be unfortunate the other thing that i would do to make sure that when you're going over these longer time ranges and potentially using uh more products is this output crs right um the uh the output crs is actually just this right and so we can manually just specify this without it like once we kind of figure out like what we want um we can just put this here and um the oh to espg uh, uh you you can you can just put the string there um and it should be fine um but the the idea is so, so that way you, you don't have to calculate it each time and then like you don't really have to worry about getting the crs the second thing that i would investigate is is there landsat dat 7 uh data data is no good from due to the scan problem yeah thank you um th that's basically the summary and so uh you would have to go into load ard and i i have to, i would have to remember how to do that and you can you can say you can tell it to accept um that and so that's in the data handling um where's the data the data handling right and we can go to so what we're so this contains the load ard function right so we can just go control find load ard and so this this parameter here ls7 slc off um is set to true you might want to set that to false i don't know what would happen um because there's going to be gaps in the landsat 7 data but because we're making these big long composites it should be fine i think it i, I think it will be fine and so set that to false and hopefully it will work um if it's not feel free to contact me <laughs> um uh, on whatsapp or wherever and, and I'll, I'll be happy to help you um so set this to false and everything will be much better the other option that I was kind of pointing out that has uh, kind of better coverage, right, is you can go and use, oh, because you want all the way back to 85. Okay, I see, I see now the problem. Um, for other people who are just looking for different areas, right, uh, the annual geomedians um, can be quite helpful. Um, I don't know if they have, I, I just want to make sure they have all the bands to calculate. Yeah, we have enough bands to calculate. Um, so that might be helpful if you need a different spatial extent. Okay. Getting back to the coastal erosion. This is taking longer, way longer than I thought. So, um, <laughs> the good question though, that was a very good question. I I'm, I'm glad we were able to work through that together. Um, where were we? This area. Oh, so the final step is that we actually, um, save this, save these vector lines that we generate in this step to a uh to a file here called output water lines <laughs> excuse me to output water lines and uh 
that's just saved here. And then what we can do is that we can open up uh, with the map shapefile script, right? We can actually open up this thing in an interactive uh, folium uh, map to then go ahead and view them, right? Okay, this seems this seems good, right? Um, I want to quickly go over the modifications I made, um, and I, I probably won't run this notebook again. So I start the DAS cluster. I have the things. So here here's the first modification I made, right? which is that coasts don't tend to be square, <laughs> right? Coasts tend to be kind of long. And uh, and if you're drawing a rectangle, um, yes. Uh, if you're drawing a rectangle, feel free to add another buffer, right? So we can have a latitude buffer and a latitude buffer and a longitude buffer and a longitude buffer, right? And so I can actually, let's say I'm actually not interested in St. Louis so much, but I'm actually interested in the the actual coast running um, all the way up and down. I yeah, I'm ex uh, I I do think it's the Landsat seven issue that you're having there. Um, we can work on that uh, more. And so I created a separate buffer here, and I also made uh, one much much larger than the other, right? And uh, and we're mapping that. Now, if you did this right. Um, a couple things will happen. Um, one is that we have more time slices, but it also gets very, very, very long, right? So this will actually look. Our RGB will actually come out all right, but you may want to you may want to actually look at this, and this is not very observable in the current notebook. So one thing to uh, try always is that there's usually a size parameter that's available, and so you can always just start. You can always just start tar start typing the word size hit tab and if it auto completes then you can set it to something um, here i'm going to set it to 20 and then now i can actually kind of see what's going on here uh, i can go to let's say a different time slice and that looks all right notice again the bright sand on the coast is kind of being mis miscategorized um, we could change our load ard parameters uh, to overcome this issue, but it's more involved. Um, I'm actually just going to leave it up to having enough captures because we are capturing over a whole year. These these changes take over take place over a long period of time, so uh, I'm not too worried about it. Um, the other way uh, to change this, right, is that if you if you were to run this. In the default notebook, it would it would look something like this, which just looks absolutely atrocious, right? Um, and the Kenneth, to the oh, I should I should maybe run it on that area. Um, the one way I've to actually done the summary for you so that we save time, sir. Thank <laughs> thank you. Uh, so the the fig size is another parameter that can be used to change this, right? Um, and so I can do this as like, this is a one by 10. And the what I how I know to set it to this is I'm using the ratio of my two buffers uh, that I set. Um, up here, right, is that uh, I lost my spot. There we go. Uh, I basically set this, this is like a, you know, this is basically a 1 to 10. That's the size of the strip, right? And that's what I'm using to reset the sizes of my plots uh, down here. This one automatically did the aspect ratio. Here, I need to keep it in mind, and it actually works out quite nicely. But if we go down to here, right, and I do, uh, and I do fig size here, this is actually going to turn out really not well it's going to look quite atrocious right so uh like two by 20 is the size of the figure i want and i wanted to explain real quickly why this doesn't work it's going to take a while so i want to give you a heads up brian we have about six seven minutes left uh, in our that's fine Meeting here. Right, we're, we're on track. Then. Well, that's uh, loading. I'm going to send a link to the chat um, for our help desk. And if there's any 
uh, other technical questions or uh, inquiries that uh, we may be able to help with outside of uh, the rest of the team, uh, those requests can be sent there and we'll get back to you uh, over that channel. Right. So I tried to fix the aspect ratio of this by setting the fig size here in this plot command. And this plot command is built into X-Ray to make it really easy to like visualize the output of things. Um, but it can be a little bit harder to adjust the output compared to regular map plot, right? And so the fig size does is actually working correctly here, but it's not doing what you know you would normally expect it to do. And that's usually because we usually only have one plot per figure, right? And fig size is actually adjusting the total like the invisible bounding box around everything. And because I'm actually looking at multiple plots here, I've I've made it squish everything into uh, the area I wanted for a single plot. And that's why it looks absolutely atrocious. So what I really need to use is the aspect um, command and the, uh, the aspect and the size. And basically this works by adjusting the size of each subplot instead of the figure overall. And basically what it is, is it's for the X value, it's the aspect time, the size, and then it's just the size for the Y value, right? So it, uh, so this should actually work out quite well. So I'm saying the aspect ratio is like one to 10 and that I want the, like the, the large size, the largest dimension to be 20. And voila. And now everything looks better. I do have this giant color bar that I can adjust the size of, but now I can actually see. Uh, uh, Brian, there. I think your uh, screen needs a refresh. Oh, you okay. wouldn't mind. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for letting me know. So, and, and now everything looks mm. much better. It's actually legible for this long, skinny plot that I'm doing. And uh, the color bar is a little bit big, but we can adjust that individually afterwards. Um, so we, we extract our lines. And then what's really interesting here is that we can actually see uh, when we run this, right? Um, this is a little bit hard to see because it is such a large area, right? So this is really where the interactive map shines. So when I put this on the interactive map, we can actually see something kind of interesting happening here which is that the there's actually been quite a significant change in these sandbars over time, right? That this this sandbar has been consistently shrinking over time. I, I, I doubt y'all can see the blue outline. Like we should probably use a different color map if we had the time, but it goes purple and then blue. And then, uh, then there's this light green one here, and then there's like a yellow one and it gets, it keeps getting smaller. And so we can actually kind of date where the Google satellite imagery is coming from in the background. And then the other thing that's kind of interesting here is you can see that this uh, sandbar has actually been growing uh, southwards. Um, we can see there's been significant change here and that there's been some like thinning, uh, or actually this has been thickening over time uh, as well. So um, uh, while there's been some thinning up in this region, which is kind of interesting. Um, and it just shows you that the, the coast can actually quite dramatically change uh, just over a period of a few years. Um, and we can see that this, this sandbar really has been progressing southward and growing at quite a, quite a rapid rate, actually, um, as we scroll through. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if we have any more questions, but... Um, Very informative. Yeah. So thank you, Brian, for this uh, very wonderful lecture and also the interactive part we've had also with Karia. Yeah. She's been able to share her story. Uh, Karia, is, is your hand still up or uh, you have another question? So if not, I've got... yes, yes. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. And also in my... In my account, when I'm trying to, uh, to, 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 to run the coastal erosion, uh, the map shape file is not working. The block of map shape file is not working. When you're trying to show it on the interactive map? 
coastal erosion, yeah. The block of map shape file is not working. So as oh. to, to show, to, to see the, yeah, drawing conclusion. So under, under the extracting shorelines from imagery? Yeah, because when I'm trying to plot interactive map, I can't plot it because the shape file is providing a name. Right, so one thing is to make sure that the shape file is in the correct directory of okay. where that it is. When you look at here, let me share my screen one more time. So, mm -hmm. so he, right here, right, okay. is w the output path to where we're saving the file, right? Okay. And, um, and when we go to the file browser, right, I... I in order to display these lines on the interactive map, this mm -hmm. GeoJSON that I created needs to be in the same directory at the same oh, time as, okay. yeah. as the, so if you've moved the notebook to somewhere else, right, it, you just need to make sure that these are in the same place for them to work well together. And in this, if this ship file should be in this extension, the ship file, uh, it which, should be in which the, extension supports so there, I don't know if, if you have multiple shape files named the same name, that might also be an issue. I think they should just overwrite each other. Um, the, uh, there's also uh, the, so there's also the geodata. I mean, we're really using the geodata frame in the folium. Um, okay. I, I, we may, let's talk offline. Let's, let's wrap up the meeting and then I, I can stay after and we can. We can troubleshoot. Sorry, account. We we can we can we can uh, talk after the meeting real quick. If you if you have oh, yeah. for just a second. <laughs> Thank you very much, Karia. Uh, Edward Boma, do you have anything for us? Sir? Um, no, Ken. I think uh, today's uh, today's live session actually went great. So probably next week I'll prepare something, then we can also share with the team. But thank you, Brian, for, for, for the presentation and also the questions that Keria asked. Thank you very much. And also thank you, Josh, for being our time moderator.